Dorothea Lange is one extraordinary human being. Um, I, I have always loved the photographs that I've seen of hers, but I had no idea of who this human being was until I started digging in with this. Um, she was really unique to her time and a very courageous woman in many ways and exasperating in others. Uh, basically, she kind of falls uncomfortably in the category of documentary photographer, although um, I think she was really on her own course and, and did something that was unique to her time. Um, she really, in her mature work, it was a collaborative thing between her and her husband, uh, Paul Taylor, who was an economist um, and actually involved in, in uh, the Farm Service Administration during the, during the 30s. And that's how they got together. But what I'm gonna do is do a really quick um, uh, bio of her, give you some kind of context with this lady. Um, she was born in Hoboken in, in um, 1895 and basically um, contracted polio at about age seven, got through it, but it did um, give her a slight deformity in her, in her leg and her foot. So she walked with a limp for most of her life, all of her life. What am I talking about? Most of her life. It was with her. And that was a difficult companion for her in many ways, but it was a teacher too. Um, her mother said to her, try and walk as straight as you can. <laughs> and um, she did a pretty good job. Anyway, uh, her father uh, abandoned them in 1907. So when she was about 12, her father left, left the family. They went and lived with uh, the grandmother. And um, when Dorothea graduated from high school, at some point or other, she decided that she was gonna be a photographer. She had never picked up a camera. Don't know where that came from, but she knew that that's what she wanted to do. And what she did was go to New York and get a job in, in various photography studios, apprenticed that way, learned, learned what she could from that, took classes at um, uh, Columbia University with um, a fellow named uh, Clarence White, who was a pretty well-known um, portrait photographer um, and then she apprenticed she she worked in another uh, portrait studio so she got the idea of what it was like to do society portraits and what that was all about um, when she hit about 22 or 23 she and a friend of hers decided that it was time for them to leave and see the world so they, they took all their money and, and put it together and went, set off on a world tour in 1918. Pretty courageous for a, a 22 year old girl. Um, and off they went. They made it to San Francisco and her girlfriend had her pocket picked and all their money was gone. So San Francisco was where they stayed, and she got a job in a, in a uh, went out the next day, went out and got a job developing um, film in, in a studio, and through that met the husband, and I can't remember his name now, of Imogene Cunningham, who, if any of you know her, she's a really fabulous photographer. Um, just a really wonderful, you know, uh, she did a lot of dance photography and things like that. that. So she's a whole other story and maybe we'll get to that someday. But um, 
Imogene took her under her wing. And basically, they, they saw this woman as a really extraordinary human being and decided that she was definitely somebody that they were going to um, take in. So basically, um, they introduced her to the bohemian life in San Francisco. Um, uh, they they basically helped her to um, connect with um, someone who was willing to back Dorothea in creating her own portrait studio, which she did very successfully. Um, basically, um, at the time, you know, in the in the twenties, there was a quite a social elite in San Francisco. So she did a lot of, of social, very high um, social shots. And here's a couple of examples. Um, and basically her, her studio, she was working her, her brains out and she'd work 12 to 18 hours a day developing photographs. And then in the evening, she would set up kind of a gathering place for artists in her inner studio. So uh, people would come in and, and, and talk and, and hang out. Um, so she met and married an established artist by the name of Maynard Dixon, who was 20 years her senior um, in 1920. Um, and basically, um, the, the painting on the right is one of his pieces. Um, he, he was, uh, did a lot of poster work and things like that, but he was also, you know, known for doing murals and larger scale pieces. Um, so he was an example of what an, a mature artist was about for her. Um, on the left is, is basically how Dorothea adapted those, ex, those early experiences as a portrait photographer to what she would come to do later on in her mature work. So as things went along, um, Maynard went out to the Southwest to paint a lot. So Dorothea went along with him and she did shots out there of um, uh, this, this fellow out in, out in the, in, in the, basically in nature. She, what she said was we went into the country and, and it was endless and timeless and cut off from the pressures that I thought were part of life. The earth and the heavens, even the changes of seasons, I'd never really experienced them until that time. I then became aware. <laughs> so um, basically, what, what, what began to transpire is that, you know, as the social unrest of the late twenties and early thirties came, um, she turned her eye to looking out the window of her studio and began to see these things that were, that were happening out there. Um, one of, let's see. Uh, what she said was, I can only say I was looking at something. Okay, this is, this is in reference to the White Angel Breadline, which is one of her masterpieces. You know, there are moments like these when time stands still and all you can do is hold your breath and hope it waits for you. Sometimes you have the inner sense that you have encompassed the thing generally you know then that you're not taking anything away from anyone, their privacy, their dignity, their wholeness. 
So this was this was basically her uh, agenda. She went out onto the streets with her camera and and shot the the experiences that were that were happening out there on the streets. Well, we'll go here. From the late 1920s, she she began to you know see the 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 disparity, the 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 strikes, the unemployment, the the unrest and homelessness on the streets, and the the dynamics of of the the wealth and power and the people the powerless that were that were really out there. Um, she was in the middle of, of uh, the dock workers strike and there was there was tear gas and all that flying around. One of the reasons why I wanted to do Dorothea Lang is yes, there is there was an exhibit at the uh, Museum of Modern Art that all of us missed, which um, there's a great book out called um, uh, Words and Pictures and we're gonna get a copy of that at the library but also the correlation between what's happening now and the strife that we're experiencing in society and, and some of the, the really devastating things that were happening back then. Um, and those power dynamics are the things which we're, we're exploring at this point in a very different way. And, you know, the depression went on for 10 years Hopefully we're not in for something like that, but but there's there's a there's a correlation in the times. Um, so basically, what happened is is she was uh, given an exhibition by um, a photographer by the name of Willard Van Dyke, who actually was a, was a documentary photographer and. And, and documentary filmmaker who was running the film department at SUNY Purchase when I was there. So that was an interesting little, little um, note when I was reading through this stuff. Anyway, he gave her a gallery show and Paul Taylor, who was, who be, who was to become her second husband, saw her work. And what he had been doing is going out and he had been doing reports for the what was to become the um, Farm um, Services Administration. And he was using photography to illustrate his reports, but he knew there was more to it than what he was able to do. And when he saw her photography, he said, this person is somebody who I need to get in touch with. So basically the impact on him, what he did was he recruited her and he had to, um, through, through the government agency that he was working through, he had to sign her on as a secretary and um, other things. <laughs> with with other, other administrative tasks, which had to do with her camera. Um, as soon as he went out with her and he saw what she was producing, he put his camera away and never touched it again. As far as he was concerned, he had found his eyes. Um, so basically they went out and hit the road and were experiencing in 1934 33, 34, the massive displacement that was happening in the, in the, in the country. Through drought and dust storms, it, it, you know, it became really clear, the social discrepancy became really clear. This shot with the next time try a train, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, These, these were the people that she saw on the road. You know, the one, the one on the left is broke down and busted in the desert. 
Um, it's just it's just remarkable stuff. Um, and this guy. No work, no money. So, um, one of the things that she said, and one of her quotes is, the words that come direct from the people are the greatest. They are those words that I wrote down in my notebooks 25 years ago with great excitement, just hoping I could hold on to them until I got back to the car. If you substitute one word out of their vocabulary, it disappears before your eyes. So this is your country. Don't let the big men take it away from you. You know, how much does air cost now? <laughs> um, and the, the, one, the one on the left is, it was um, uh, Grandma showing her quilt. So the, the, one of the things that they, that they were up to with this, and one of the things that, that Taylor wanted to illustrate for the uh, general farm services was um, the, Larry? The, yes. Somebody said um, one dollar for three minutes at the gas station. That's what air cost now. <laughs> That's right. As opposed to it's you know, your country. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta. There you go. Interesting um, <laughs> bit of information. So, basically, what 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 Paul Taylor was was about was trying to bring these these dire circumstances to the Congress. Um, he was working through a fellow by the name of Stryker at the General Services Administration, General Farm. General Farm Services Administration, and they were trying to bring these this stuff through to the Congress to get them to understand the plight that these people were living with. So, um, you know, So this is, this is an image. Um, she was driving home from Southern California after having done a photo shoot with, with, uh, with Paul. And um, she drove past a, a, a pea pickers camp. There was a little sign on the side of the road. And she just kept driving past it. She had all of her stuff packed up in the back. She didn't want to stop in there, but it kept working on her as she was driving up the road. And, and it really got to her. All of a sudden, she just found herself doing a U-turn on the highway and coming back. And this is what she saw when she got there. What had happened was the, there was a freeze, and, and the pickers were kind of stuck there. There was... There was there was no picking to be done, and they were kind of stranded in this place. Um, and she just got her camera out and started shooting. And there's a series of photographs that came out of this, which are classic. Um, the migrant agricultural workers' family, seven hungry children. Okay, you can, you can read this. This, this woman, 32 years old, was out there um, in, in devastating circumstances. Um, and 
one of the things that um, that she did was she took a series of shots here. Um, basically, each one of them, to me, are really are really gorgeous and amazing shots. And this shot is actually the one that all of us know. I mean, this is, this is one of those things which kind of encapsulates the depression years and, and you know, the, the anxiety and the courage of that, of that time. Larry, do yes. you know if she paid any of these women um, after she took that photograph? No, and she was paid nothing but but the stipend that she got for oh, okay. working for the General Services Administration. Um, but that's that's a whole other story. Later on, this this lady, um, when she contracted cancer, um, let it be known that she saw no money from this photograph, and it actually a a lot of people donated money to her to help her through her hospital time in the 60s. So on the one hand, <laughs> she did not get paid. On the other hand, she did. Um, so uh, migrant mother no longer belongs to me. It's all over. Why is that? I would like to put up a fine print of it, along with it, one or two others that were made at the same time of the same subject. This is what I, this is what it came out of. So it's a very powerful set of images. Each one of them is, is to me, a, 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 a masterpiece in its own way. But the other one was picked up by the San Francisco newspapers, and that's what got out there. So on the... On the right hand side, this, this guy was a uh, out of work um, um, Oregon logger waiting to pick peas. Um, and one of the quotes that I got from, from Dorothea is, many times I've encountered courage, real courage, undeniable courage. I've heard it said, that that was the highest quality of the human animal. I encountered that many times in unexpected places, and I've learned to recognize it when I see it. So these photographs of children are, are quite remarkable. Um, you know, I didn't talk much about Dorothea's children and, and the, the challenge of, of being the kind of committed artist and photographer that she was and the difficulty that must have been for her children who were often left to uh, foster homes to... Um, care with other people while she went off on these journeys to do these photographs and her commitment to, to these things. There's, there's a wonderful shot of, of this arm with, with a, with a armload of daisies that were picked by her son, Daniel Dixon. And, and, um, rather than taking the daisies, she got out her camera and took a photograph of, of his hand holding them. 
<laughs> and he said, I could never figure it out. <laughs> How many children did she have? Uh, she had two children of her own and three foster children. So she had uh, two children. Actually, she had one child with, with Maynard Dixon and one with, um, with Paul Taylor. So, you know, at that time, you know, one of the things that happens in these photographs is, is you know, that there's, there's that ambivalence that she must have felt about what, about what she was doing. She talked about that in, in, there's a, I'll talk, I'll talk more about this, but there's a wonderful documentary um, that is available on Canopy and I will have um, uh, information at the end of this that you can tune into it. Great. Um, this, um, the, the American Masters uh, did this, this, um, documentary called grab a hunk of lightning and it was it was basically a, a lot of shots a lot of tape from interviews with Dorothea while she was still alive um, the the documentary was put together in 2014 by her granddaughter and and um, a lot of the interviews goes basically it deals with this issue of, of her ambivalence and her, you know, her sense of, of not knowing quite how to deal with the kids and, and deal with her career. Um, so these shots of children are quite remarkable. Um, Now they're children of, of the 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 um, basically the migrant workers and 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 of um, uh, the squatters and and um, tenant farmers. So one of the things that they did was during the during the winter months they they went out and did the did the the work among the migrant workers during the summers they used to go to the south they'd go to mississippi they'd go to alabama they'd go to carolina and georgia and shoot the the tenant farmers and the sharecroppers and that was mainly the black population and the interesting part was the General Farm Services only wanted the shots of the white farm workers because they knew that they could use those with the congressman. The congressman could relate to those white farmers, but the blacks were something that they she did for them and they followed this, but at the time it was not right. So there are just these amazing, amazing shots. So um, one of the things that 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 Paul was all about was trying to help, you know, get relief for these people and get them better working circumstances. And all of you who have read or seen um, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath and all that, um, that section of the, of, the, of the story where they get to the sanitary work farm, um, that was the outgrowth of this work. Basically, there were only 12 of those that were experimental camps that were set up throughout the United, throughout um, California and the United States. And 
and basically it was out of this work that 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 Dorothea and Paul were doing that that made it possible for those experiments to happen. Um, they were not as widespread as they could have been, and that would have been a blessing for these people. Larry, do you know anything about the camera she used to take the shots? Uh, really, I don't. Okay. Uh, it was a five by five, I know that. Um, it was a, you know, a large, large camera. Uh, she did use a couple of different cameras, one that was more portable and one that was she had to set up on the tripod and all that. So although a lot of these shots look like they're really spontaneous, some of them were really setups. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to get that kid to hold that position for a, a few minutes for her. Um, okay. Okay, so here's a quote from her. I had begun to talk to people, I, the people I photographed. And in the city, people were silent. They never spoke to each other. But in the migrant camps, there, there, were, talk, there were always talkers. It gave us a chance to meet on common ground something a photographer like me must find if he's going to do the work. So the one on the left said something to the effect of, you got to keep your gumption. If that goes, you're done. <laughs> were all her shots in black and white yes all of these shots were black and white and actually i don't think that even the shots in the 60s were color Okay, so these guys. Wait, excuse me, Claire, could you use the chat function and ask a question and type a question? Okay, just go on, Claire. Right. Okay, so, so, this is a quote from these guys. Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Who are we going to fight? If we fight, what are we going to whoop? So these guys are, you know, they're tenant farmers. They're, you know, they're off the land. There's nothing. So this is what happened at that time. And one of the things about Dorothea is, is really she was on to the ecological disaster that was behind all of this. That the technology and the displacement of these people was not just because of the weather. It was really, you know, this is pulled tractor out. Um, and, and well, I know I've got to go to move, but I don't know where to. I've got two horses left, two cows, some farm tools, oh, a grocery bill. So, you know, basically you can see it, you know, those furrows lead right up to that abandoned house. There's no place for these people anymore. You know, one tractor can do the work of 20 men. Um, and basically the, the agricultural displacement was, was there, they were never coming back.
So. In in um, 1940, basically the the funding dried up for the program. The um, you know she had been she had been um, fired three times from the job over over the time that 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 she had worked for the uh, Farm Services Administration, but. This one w was about it because basically we were we were the writing was on the wall. We were headed into World War II. This is a whole other other ball game. Um, so you know that was that was sort of the end of of this period in her life. Um, what came fairly soon after that was. Okay, this is, they, they published a book um, called um, basically um, it was, it was uh, of the photographs and of the, the sayings from these people in 1940. It got published in 1941. So it it just basically by the by World War Two this this you know it was published but it went missing it didn't it didn't get out to the public more or less but the end end pages of the book were were sayings directly from the people and there it's quite powerful um, it's you know it's called Amer an American Exodus the erosion of of uh, the American farm. Um, now, 1942, they hire Dorothea to take photographs. This was the this was the, the army hired Dorothea to take photographs of the the Japanese um, internment and and the and and they wanted her to follow this ordinance orderly um, um, uh, concentration or, or movement of these people into these, into these wonderful camps. Well, Dorothea didn't quite see it that way. And one of the things that she did was take shots of the, of the desperation of these people. And, and it was a very powerful, the, the, the photograph on the right is, is, these these kids were all born in the USA, and they're you know they're saying the pledge to the, to of the allegiance to the flag. They felt every word of it, and and yet you know they end up in these in these what were really prison camps, and and lost everything. Um, so uh, Dorothea did a really great job. And they buried every one of those photographs until after the war. So now I'm going to go into the series of, of the, the tenant farmers and things that she was taking during the summer. Um, throughout the time that she was working for the Farm Services Administration, they were taking these trips down south. And she was seeing something quite different from... Uh, what was being presented in, in other situations. Um, the, the, the thing that goes with the picture on the right was cotton picker work from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. You know, you look at these people and you see the, you know, just the, the, the dignity that's still there inside them. And that's one of the things that Dorothea could see. Now the shot on the, on the left is, is a really powerful piece. And you can see on the very left-hand edge of the screen 
that is Paul Taylor, Dorothea's husband, talking to this overseer to keep the guy steady so that she could get the shot. But the dynamics of this shot and the sense of, of you know, the position that that giant white hulk of a man standing in front of these men seated below him. Um, it's really, you know, she got a good one here and it says a lot. The one, the one on the right is just such a powerful photograph. I mean, you know, ex-slave with a long memory. Uh, she took a lot of shots of ex-slaves and they're, they're, these are, a lot of these shots are available through the Library of Con Congress. They're actually rights free. So um, I, I will have a link at the end to that too. So you can go and, and look at these and, <clears throat> and a lot more. Hold on. <clears throat> I'm talking away. Um, so let's see. Ah, this shot. Amazing photograph. Just amazing photograph. Larry, when you say it's an amazing photograph, what do you really, what do you, what about it makes it so amazing now? Well, I mean, the, the, first off, just the, the textures uh -huh. of the photograph, the, the content of the photograph, the, the play of the commercial uh, signs all over the wall and these guys who, you know, they're, they're taking a break from what's hard, hard scrabble life. Um, you know, here's a quote. Um, when you're doing a lot of hard, fast field work, it's, it's a physical necessity to forget every day. You got to face a fresh every day. You have to try to remember you have to try, you can't try to remember in any continuity. So, you know, this is, this is like, again, this, this fellow that's standing in the door, looking down at these folks, there's a positioning that's happening in here. But as far as a photograph is concerned, look at the textures of the thing. Look at the, look at the, the dynamics of the, of, of the, of the piece, those stones that are holding up that porch, that those those trees that are that are acting as posts to the the porch roof, you know, look at the content, look at the characters, look at these guys, look at the guys' faces. Dorothea had a long conversation with these guys before she took this shot. Okay, so. On the left is a shot that was taken in, in the 50s. Actually, it was, I believe, 1953. And it's called Defendant. Um, it, it, can, it could just as well be taken today. The, the, the sense of, of, you know, being in, in that man's position um, in a courtroom. Now, okay, this is, this is on to, on to another story. Um, this is from, um, 1953. Um, she got an assignment from Life Magazine to go and shoot shots of this Monticello Valley in Northern California that was a farming community that um, they were building this wonderful dam um, at the end of the valley. And this fertile farmland was going to be covered by a reservoir. Um, 
And, you know, these people had really fine farms. They were doing, they were doing just fine. Thank you very much. But in the name of progress, that dam needed to be put in. And so basically they were, they were really displaced. The, the livelihood that, that shot of the kid sitting on the, lying on the back of that horse is just amazing. You know, look at, look at how relaxed that kid is. He's like, you know, I, I, I know this horse. <laughs> I'm comfortable here. I could sleep up here. <laughs> The look, that look on that kid's face is just priceless. So, um, you know, what happened was they, they, um, in the name of progress, these farms were, were displaced. And, you know, one of the things that, that Dorothea, um, documented was Basically, what they did was come in and tear down all the trees, tear down the houses, flatten everything in the entire valley, and it was covered. Um, so the issues of environmental degradation were things that she was seeing early on. The question of what progress is all about. What, what's progress and what's degrading our environment? Um, that's something that, you know, I don't know the answer to, but it looks to me like there's problems. So one of the things that she did, she, she, she was sick for the, the last 20 years of her life. She had um, um, ulcers and, and a lot of digestive problems and all that. Paul Taylor cared for her and and um she had to be on a strict regimen of food and vitamins and and um medicines that he actually helped her with um he was very supportive of her throughout her career he saw her as the genius that she was Dorothea was not comfortable with the name artist. She didn't wear it well. She had a hard time seeing herself as that. Though, though toward the end of her life, I think she began to wear it a little, little, a little better. Um, because there was nobody else doing what she does and doing what she did at the time. You know, basically the collaborative work that she did something unique to her time and something that's a lot more common now for artists to get together as 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 collaboratives and put together things that were works that added up to more than what any one person could bring to it and she and and Paul Taylor who was a um basically an economist but an econ a land reform economist, a, an economist that was working with farmers and understanding how, how, the, how integral that all was. Um, that, that's something that was unique and didn't fit comfortably into any categories. And, and now she was really a pioneer in this area. That's, that's one of the things that she brings to all of this. So Paul Taylor went on to work with the UN as a land reform economist and toured the world and went to different parts of the world and brought Dorothea with him. Um, the picture on the, on the left is, is uh, from Egypt. The one on the right, I lost. <laughs> I don't remember where it's from, but it's part of this tour. Um, um, and basically, let's see if I've got notes on that. No. Okay. Um, but there were a lot of these shots. 
Okay. And basically in the late fifties, she went on to, you know, early sixties. She was really, she was really quite ill by then. Actually by, I believe 62 or 63, she had been diagnosed with, um, with cancer. And, um, in, in 64, she was approached by the Museum of Modern Art to put together a retrospective. And she worked on that um, for the last couple of years of her life. Um, and these shots were part of that, that, that world tour that she took with her husband, Paul Taylor. Um, the Middle East, Asia, um, and this is a shot that was taken by one of her assistants. These are Paul Taylor's hands holding her. Uh, it's just so tender. So this shot is one of the shots of the of the, the the DPs the the Japanese displaced. This is a, it's such a great shot. Um, so I'm gonna kind of end end with this one. On the on the left hand side, there's there's a link to the the MoMA audio. Um, there's a bunch of shots archived there that if you click on the shots, you can hear um, curators and, and poets and other photographers talking about those shots. So there's about, I think about 12 to 15 shots there. Plus there's a, um, a about an hour long video interview with Sally Mann, who was a contemporary photographer with the woman who put together the exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, the curator. Um, and Sally Mann was very profoundly affected by Dorothea Lange um, in, in the integration of words and images and how powerful that can be. Um, underneath that is a, is a um, shot of uh, is a link to the um, Library of Congress. And a lot of these shots are archived there. So you can, you can go and see a lot of that stuff. Right, if you can't copy down the link, don't forget this is being recorded. So you could right. go to our website in a couple of days when it's um, edited, this film is edited, and you'll be able to see this whole film again and go to the very end and you'll be able to copy down the link. Right. So the links yes. are there. Yes. And also, I just somebody asked about the book clubs. The book clubs will. I'm um, sorry, I didn't know they weren't up yet, but the book clubs will be up soon. Um, they're all set up, and it's starting in September. And the books are available whenever you want. Okay. Go ahead, Larry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, it's okay. So you know, basically, that's 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 about it. Dor Dorothea put together the the retrospective of her of her photographs at, at the Museum of Modern Art um, with the curator. She died in in um, in 66, I believe it was 65 or 66. Um, uh, let's see, she died in 65. That's what it was. Three months later, the exhibition went on view at the Museum of Modern Art. She was the first female photographer to have a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. And it was a powerful piece. Um, I, I, there's a, there, we have a copy of, of, the, of the book that was done from the 2014 um, um, PBS. Um, bio and and that'll be at the library um, there is also a book out from the 2020 exhibition 
that just took place. It was in February through, um, I believe it was through April. So not many of us got to see it, but we can see the photographs. And if you go to the Museum of Modern Art, they do have archived, I believe, something around 600 of her photographs archived. Though those are not downloadable, the ones from the the, um, the Library of Con Congress are. Okay. Um, Larry, do you want to say anything about next week's program? Uh, okay. Well, next week we're going to go to a very different place. We're going to go to um, visit with Vermeer. It's a very <laughs> tranquil space, very different from this one. Um, you know, I I feel like we need to recognize the social strife that we're dealing with in the world today, but also be aware of the of the the tranquil space that we can all move into. That's a good idea. Yeah. Very good. Thank you for saying that. Thank you all for coming again. Enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.